Hey, everybody. That is Gary Smith. It's hot. That is Kaz Kenny. Woo, it is hot. Oh. And I am Eddie Bramble, and this is episode 57 of the Blackwater's Edge podcast. What do we need to get to like 50,985? I hope we make it that far. I don't know if we're going to live that long. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll we'll post not, it. That's when we'll start doing the repeats. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we'll, we just, yeah. we'll do the reruns. There's then. one for 19... 2020, <laughs> Our hey, first show. I'll tell you what. We got an absolute lot to talk about here today. Oh, my goodness, Oh, my yes. God. I, I don't even know if we can get it all in an hour, but we're going to try to we're do gonna that. We're going to try. So. Want to talk a little bit about fishing? Yeah, start your fishing report all first. All right. So, the fishing's been uh, pretty freaking awesome the last two days. You know, it's kind of picked up a little bit. Today's been today's been pretty good. You know, we have no water right now, so it's kind of playing back and forth with when we get the tide coming in and we got a little bit of water. When the tide's out, we ain't got nothing. I can tell you right now, a little chop tank still low as can be. Um, lots of snakeheads caught yesterday evening from what I heard. Mm-hmm. Um, we caught three. Yeah. I knew Leroy was out there. I knew Kyle was out there. I know a ton of Brandy was out there yesterday fishing, took her son out there. So, I mean, a lot of people were out fishing yesterday and a lot of people were connecting with a lot of stuff. So yeah, we, 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 we went, through. yeah, we went, we uh, three with cameras on us. So that's as yeah. good as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always tough when you get the camera on. I mean, anybody who does YouTube videos knows that the, the snakes never like to bite when the camera's running. So, 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 so let's go ahead and just let everybody know a little bit about what, what, what we've been doing. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, for those that don't know, you know, this week we've been filming with Delmarva Outdoors. Yep. We'll be um, on, uh, this Saturday at 7.30, if I remember, 7.30, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah seven thirty. Seven thirty, eleven thirty. Yeah, and I tell you what, Andrew was just a stand-up oh, guy. I, I really like that guy. I, I tell you what, he's doing a. I look, I, I miss Captain Willie, but let me tell you what, Andrew's doing a hell of a job over there, man. He's really doing a great yeah, job. He's doing a great know? job. I mean, all, all the con- content he's getting and things like that. I mean, it is just good stuff. So, uh, and then we were doing some filming with WBAL. They were down here. We were doing some yep. filming with that. And they were down here again yesterday, and they were visiting actually with the guests that we had yeah, today with our, on with the show. Guests today. Um, we're, we're learning a lot, you know? Oh yeah. We're always learning. If, you if you're not learning, you're doing something wrong. That's, you know, that's the way I look at we, it. We thought we knew a lot and we're simply getting to learn more, you know? And I think that's the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, still don't. I, I can tell you though, honestly, in the last month, I think I've learned more biologically about things than anything, you know? It's, it's been a really good thing for me, you know, to talk to these biologists and to, to discuss what I've seen, what they've seen. And, you know, and the good thing is, is the community is getting involved. Oh, yeah. And, and they're also helping, you know. So that, that's a good thing. And we're blessed to have the community standing with us the way they are. And We've re- got really one of the best fishing communities oh, out there, God, for sure. That's we. no doubt about it. You know, snakehead anglers, no matter who you are, we are, we are pretty much just stand-up people. You right. know what I mean? We like to fish. We like to harvest some fish. Some like to let them go. Whatever it does, snakehead fishing is just awesome. You know exactly. what I mean? But yeah, but yeah, we caught three yesterday, and and it was it was rough because when we we first went out there, the water was down, down, yeah. down. It was it took us. A minute I was worried get, when you guys went. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, it, it took us a minute just to get out of the river because I mean we were bottomed out. I for told the first. Andrew, so when we coming in, I said, "You want to film this? <laughs> <laughs> did, he, did he have to hold on for dear life or not? Oh, just put two feet on the bow and held on to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> made a run for the. Were you mud jumping? Ramp. Were you mud oh, jumping? Oh yeah, we were mud jumping yeah, mud for sure. <laughs> Wah, 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 wah. But but we were struggling for the first hour and a half, and then Andrew had to leave at around five, and right at four forty five, his bite went, bite turned on, yeah. and we caught probably three fish in probably ten minutes, and yeah. it was just great. I had texted you at four thirty, yeah. I think, asking you how you were doing, and you texted me back at four forty five, said we just got one, and I'm thinking, dang, these guys are done at five. Well, at least they got one. Then you text back and said you guys got two more, yeah. And they were some pretty healthy fish. Oh, they were great fish. Yeah. All three of them were. Uh, at least 25 inches and six pounds or better. Good. So good, they good. were good sized fish. Let, let me ask you, let's talk a little about your fishing report. What were you guys using? Uh, Gary, you caught yours on spinnerbait or buzzbait? Buzzbait. Buzzbait, that's right. Yep. What yeah. kind of buzzbait were you throwing? Do you know? Uh, white one, but I don't, I don't know what brand. <laughs> no, hey, one. speaking yeah. of buzzbaits, we've got some really, 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 yeah, really, that's right. really good buzzbaits. But I caught, I caught mine on. On my old standby, Hyperlastics, my my favorite man. This, actually, it wasn't this color, but it was <laughs> the, this size, the five, the five inch uh, Hyperlastics and five. You know, five let me let me get my phone real quick because I I don't know if we can show this on, on on the screen or not, but you know, Ricky Ricky caught two giants on the Hyperlastics. Yeah. And here's the thing, you guys coming to fish this weekend in the tournament, if you ain't got Hyperlastics in the box. You might want to add one or two to it just to see what well, you do. Because funny. let me tell you what, everybody's smoking them on these yeah. things, well, man. I mean, even in the tournaments of 2019, before we even had the Hyperlastics here, the the tournament winners always had swim baits. That when you ask what they what they hit them on, swim baits, yeah. swim baits, swim swim baits was the number one fit, tar, uh, lure all year long. Can you see that there? That 
<laughs> those, those are, are both, the two fish that the Ricky got. You held up there. <laughs> <laughs> those are no, the two not. fish that Ricky got <laughs> on his, on his oh, hyperlastics. On hyperlastics, yeah. but these aren't just two. He had seventeen that day all mm. on hyperlastics. That's all he's really been using the last two years. I mean, these, I'm sorry, Rick. Baits. I'm sorry, Rick, but <laughs> I gotta let him know. Dude. Sorry. <laughs> but, he's uh, gonna he's so stuck while you had your chance. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's probably he's probably gonna put four flat tires on the truck when he comes out this weekend. You're so. not getting any more pictures, <laughs> right? Uh, around here really what's been going on you know i talked to brandy yesterday she got out yesterday evening she caught uh, some sun, uh, some fish over in uh federalsburg area over there uh the marshy has been pretty good you know some blue cats are still being caught but as this water warms up you're gonna see these blue cats move out of these rivers and start getting back out in like the main stem of the nanakoke and deeper stuff just outside the mouth of these rivers so uh for you blue cat guys just think about it. you got to move <clears throat> with these fish right now you know if you're not seeing them somewhere get down the river it's real important to look at water temperature and here's something a lot of people don't know. So me, when I'm fishing deep water, I always want to know what the bottom water temperature is. And you cannot effectively have that through a fish finder. Right. You know, you're seeing surface temperature. So if you want a little fishing hack, you know, get some real strong strings so you don't lose your thermometer. Get you a battery-operated, uh, you know, one of them battery-operated uh, uh, thermometers. Wrap it in saran wrap to seal it, right? Drop it down. Above a, above a weight on the line, just tie it to the line. You know what I mean? Drop it down and let it sit there for five, ten minutes and pull it up real fast. And you'll get an idea of where that bottom water temperature is. You want to look for these, you know, these big blue cats. I mean, you're looking for colder water. So if you've got 70 up in the river, which is about where we were yesterday when it got hot, you know, those fish ain't going to be up there. They're going to move down river looking for that cool water. So if you get down the mouth of these places, out in the Nanakook, check these deep holes, drop you a little thermometer, and use that little fish hack, and it'll help you find the fish. I thought you were going to tell people to buy a toy submarine. No, I was going to tell them marshmallows. But, <laughs> 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 but no, so uh, I, I've heard of a few crappy over Federalsburg. I've heard of a few uh, bluegill over Federalsburg. I've heard of some snakeheads over Federalsburg. So there's a lot of fish being caught over there. Um, over down to south to Mardella Springs, they're still having some really good bites down there. I know Wayne got down there this weekend. They caught a handful of yellow perch down there. Uh, the kids cleaned up all the trash that everybody left mm-hmm. down there. So thanks, Jaden. Thanks, Marissa, for doing that. You kids are awesome. I saw Leroy cleaning up trash, Yep, too. Leroy had a bag of trash yep. yesterday. And that's good. I mean, Leroy's you know, teaching these kids about trash, yep. too. You know? So that's good. That's the most important thing I think we need to do is teach people to be responsible when they're here and they're visiting. You know, Here within the refuge, it's been... Um, it's been tough in some of the places just because there's no water. You know, there were folks at Key Wallace yesterday are messing me all afternoon. Hey, what's going on, man? I'm not, I don't know what's going on. How much wood do you got? I don't know. None. Well, well that's probably what's up. Back in know? February, the wind was cooperating. The water was staying in the little black yeah. water. And people were catching fish left and right in February on, on Key Wallace. It was loading up on Key Wallace. That was the hot spot in February. Now the wind's changed. It's blowing the water out here. It's a lot tougher now. And, and some other things that we found out, too, the water temperature here. Like yesterday, oh goodness, yesterday yeah. morning, we were in the, I think, the 60s, the low 60s, maybe. By afternoon, we were in the mid-70s, upper 70s. Yep. Yeah, well, just yesterday afternoon, mm-hmm. where, where we caught those fish, we went right around the corner. And my brother was with me last year, and we caught all our fish last year, and it was mud yesterday. Is that same right? Pl- same yep. place. Little, just a little ditch there. That's, so, all, that is, that's where we caught them, right so, there. So the fish well, we did see some fry balls. Yes, you we did. did. Yeah. I, I forgot to tell you that. Yeah, we did. Okay. We saw, I think, three different fry balls yeah. Yeah, uh, yesterday fishing. So that would go back to last week or even the week before Yep. when we had that warm snap. And remember I told you there were canopies all down yep. that creek. Mm-hmm. And then we had a cold snap at night, and I came back, and there wasn't nothing under them canopies. Yep. So it happened, I think. It definitely. It first Not time. a lot. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was. It, was, it wasn't a huge like no. like a mass spawn no, and, like we've and seen. Yesterday in would have been the day that if they were there, you'd have seen them everywhere because right. they, they couldn't get in the frag. Yeah, exactly. and, and we saw low. and we saw them pairing up two and three weeks yep. ago, so we knew that that there was a possibility we might have a spawn coming here yeah, in it, April. We weren't sure. It, it was definitely a spawn, but it was definitely a light spawn. It, it wasn't a mass spawn. Like the, not every every right. every male was paired up. It was right. just. This, a, I th- I think what's going to happen here, yeah. and I'm I'm just foreshadowing. You know, we've got this cold snap hitting. We're gonna have a front come through tomorrow. So. It's going to stop whatever started these last two days, I yep. think. Uh, maybe not. I mean, if the rain stays in the 60s and the water stays up there and it stays warm, then it, it may just be conducive to keep them in there and get it done, you know? Mm-hmm. I did talk to some guys today that said that they have seen some canopies, you know, built in the last 24 hours. So there's probably going to be a couple more that are going to make it here. You know what I'm saying? Um, just trying to think. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, I mean, the, the Transquake and the Chickamauga coats, everything pretty much the same. You're, you'll find some crappy. You know, some guys told me they found some really nice crappy one day last week under Newbridge, you know? So, 
I don't know. Just uh, you don't know if you don't go. That's the bottom line. We've always said it. And if you're looking for nothing but big fish, remember this: you ain't gonna catch big fish every day. But they can't all be big. But they can always be fun. So come and prepare to have a fun time and enjoy yourself. And uh, if you get lucky, then maybe you'll find a pile of dragons. That's right. I've talked to some guys here. So let's talk about a little bit something we were talking about people earlier. A lot of people say, "Kaz, I'm fishing some places I was at last year. I'm just not seeing the big fish I saw last year." These big fish have not dialed into that zone yet, you know? I mean, these smaller fish, I mean, they're more active in colder water. They're, they're, they're less temperamental. They're less affected by cold fronts and things like that. So if you're not catching big fish, the only thing I can tell you is you're just not in the right place. I got a cooler out there right now that the netters brought me this morning. There's not a fish in there under 8 pounds, and I've got them up to 12 and 13 pounds. So there's plenty of fish here. I don't know why you ain't finding them, you know? So I, I, I found plenty of I mean, I've caught, I've caught probably 9 or 10 over 10 pounds this year already. I mean, I know Gary's well, caught several over 10 pounds already this year. I know you've caught – you broke 10 pounds yet this year? I haven't broke no, 10 okay, pounds Let's yet. keep it real. I was going to lie. <laughs> so, no, Eddie hasn't broke 10 pounds yet no, this I, year. No, I, I hit 7 pounds yesterday. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you don't know if you don't go. And we're yep. putting time in. And we can, we can put time in every day where the average angler can't spend the amount of time here to put patterns together and do the investigation that we're allowed to I do, just, you know. So Myself – I fish primarily black black water. I did fish Newbridge last week, but black water has just not it's not set up right yet this year. No, it's not. Temperature, the water's not right. The water when it finally did warm up, which was Wednesday, was the perfect day. The water's down. Right. Yep. You get that water up, and it warms up. It's gonna be. Yeah, we have not had a, had had a cooperative day from start to finish yet here in the black water mm. since, since it you warmed know, up. Everything's just, just not stable. We need stability. That's the thing that you got to have for successful snakehead fishing, you know? And, uh, we you know, we're going to talk with somebody today who's going to really shed a lot of insight to us, and we're going to ask some hard questions, you know? And, and let me tell you what. Might be I, easy for him. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the thing I like about this guy is he keeps it real. You know, he'll give you an honest answer. You know, he's not, not going to give you a, a bullcrap answer just to try to prop, you know, get drama or drive traffic to whatever he's doing. We better get him on here. Yeah, let's, get, right. let, let's get him on here, man. <laughs> so this week we've got Josh Newhart. Josh, how you doing today, buddy? Good. How you guys doing? Good, man. Good. Appreciate your patience while while you're listening to Kaz just yeah, <laughs> right on. Mouth, yeah. <laughs> uh, I always always appreciate a good fishing report. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know so, that good. <laughs> so for uh for those who don't know, just give a quick background about yourself, and then we'll get right in into our topics for the day. Oh uh, yeah, I'm a fish biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we have an office called uh, Office Names in Maryland Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office, and we're based out of Annapolis, Maryland. That is a quick. That is a quick rundown. So, <laughs> so, so t- let, let's talk a little about Josh. Where Josh comes from, what he likes to do. Let, let's get a little biography about Josh. So, Josh, uh, he, let's talk about. Deep. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to go deep because I want people to know who you are <laughs> and 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 know that you're just a good guy out here trying to do the right thing. So, let let's talk about your childhood. I mean, do you remember your first fishing experience? I mean, let's go back, man. When did you start fishing? I mean, I started fishing as a, as a young kid. I mean, I grew up uh, mostly in Delaware. Um, grew up fishing, you know, creek, creeks in Delaware. And then I spent a lot of time going to Delaware beaches, doing a lot of surf fishing, which I still like to do when I can get over there now. And uh, so I was always interested in fish from a young age. Initially, I wanted to be a marine biologist, probably like a lot of young kids. And then I realized, hey, I could just, as I went to college, I realized, oh, you can actually just do fish. And um, <laughs> so I actually, I actually went to... Uh, graduate school on the eastern shore there university of maryland eastern shore got my master's there and uh that actually when i started some work at blackwater where i did my uh, master's thesis and then eventually after that i got a job with fish and wildlife service and pretty much from the get-go started working with snakehead and since i've uh, been there for the last heck what is it now 12 over 12 years now it's been uh work with snakehead i work with striped bass horseshoe crab american eel whole bunch of different things so keeps me busy so was your uh your master thesis was that the first study you did here at blackwater the 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 pre-snakehead study was that the same one yeah it's, it's kind of a tie into both so there was it kind of coincided with there was a study that you know joe talked about and um the office where i'm at now was also interested in and that was interested in looking at what the fish community was um before that uh there's a weir mm-hmm. that that is up in the upper part of the Blackwater River, and that was put into, you know, I, ideally to slow saltwater intrusion in the marsh because, you know, everybody in Dorchester knows 
sea level rise coming, things have gotten a, a little bit saltier over the last uh, 30 years or so, and it was uh, killing some of the freshwater marsh and reducing some of that uh, habitat, nursery habitat, especially for anadromous fish like river herring. So that study was ongoing, and I actually looked at white perch specifically um, to see if that if saltwater intrusion actually impacted, you know, uh, their their body condition, their health, because they, you know they're a semi anadromous species, meaning that when they spawn, they you know they run up in the freshwater rivers, um, but they don't go all the way back to the ocean. You know, they hang out in the bay for, as adults for most of their lives. So, so what exactly did you find when you were studying that? Did did the saltwater affect them like you thought? Yeah, it actually did decrease their body condition a little bit. Um, it wasn't a, a huge difference, but it was significant. So the, the young that were reared in freshwater habitats, like uh, the upper Little Blackwater, for example, um, they actually fared a little bit better than ones that uh, had grown up in the brackish environment, uh, especially like the, where Blackwater is. That's interesting. So Yeah, and so we did that, and then the whole time we're recording all the fish that we were catching, not just white perch, so it kind of gave us that data set, uh, an extra year or two of data uh, from that, the weir project. So so one, once they installed the weir, did, did they do any surveying between then and the 10-year survey to see if anything changed at all, or no, just not until the 10-year survey? No, yeah, so the, the very first surveys that began were like 2006, and then I came along 2007 and eight, and we did surveys then. And unfortunately, the the weir the idea was the sample before the weir was constructed and after uh, for a year before and a year after. But the weir construction got delayed, um, and so we had two years of before data. But when snakehead showed up in 2012, at least they were first reported from the refuge in 2012. You know, at that time, snakeheads were kind of spreading a lot of places, and we were at the point as an agency where we couldn't just respond to every single snakehead report found. Like what used to happen back in like 2004 when the right. fish were up in the Potomac and yeah, elsewhere. Yeah, so, I, I, actually, I actually got to, to come down to the Crofton study. I had a friend, he was a professional biology at Goucher College and he was involved with it. And uh, Yeah, our office, is, yeah. our office was there. We had some staff there back then and we've been involved with snakeheads, you know, ever since from Crofton in 2002 and Potomac and beyond. So, so you, 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 you have pretty much dedicated many years specifically just to the snakehead. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a long time now, now you think about it. So it, uh, it creeps up on you. But, you know, and then once we heard about it in the Blackwater, you know, it's it kind of unfortunate. Like every time we hear there's somewhere new. And initially, you know, it was kind of quiet from Blackwater. And then I remember the exact year, I don't know, 14, 15, maybe even 16. That was probably the year I was screaming, yeah. <laughs> Probably, you know, you hear about well, you hear about people catching, you know, fifty fish a day from Key Wallace, and I was like, "What? Fifty fish a day?" And he, initially, you know, I'm a scientist; I can be a skeptic. I might not have believed it, but you keep hearing reports, start seeing pictures and social media, and it's like, well, there's not a lot of habitat there, and so there must be a lot of fish in Blackwater. So, uh, you know, of anywhere snake had kind of invaded, we actually had. We usually don't have a data set before snakes that invade. So we're like, well, why don't we go investigate the fish community now? Um, and we did that in 2018 and 2019 just to compare, uh, you know, what the fish community looked like before and after snakehead showed up. Now, now, now let me just clarify something because I wanted to clarify this last week while we had Joe in the podcast too. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks <laughs> want to go to farm runoff. They want to you know, sediment control, they want to go to water quality, they want to go to salt. Salt being like the biggest thing everybody wants to talk about. So, we asked Joe, at any time was the salt levels high enough to impede the existing native fish that were in the refuge? And the answer was no. Do you also say that the salt levels were never high enough to wipe out, so say, a mass of fish? Oh, no, yeah. I mean, the salt levels were actually higher in 2007, 2008. Thank um, you. That, that, that's what I wanted you to tell the public. You just said exactly what I was getting ready to say next. That's what I wanted you to say. Yeah. I looked at I mean, it, too, look. and I saw the salt. You know, I saw that it was lower in 2007, and everybody was going to the higher. salt or higher. Everybody was going to that as a reason why our native fish were disappearing. Bluegills were dying because they couldn't handle the salt. Crappies are dying because they can't handle the salt. 
you as a biologist educate the public on on these panfish. They they can tolerate salinity, you know. And I don't think a lot of people understand that that you know just because you're we're not at the bay and you're in a brackish area. You know, you're going to have some salinity there, but these fish can handle and, and thrive through that salinity, correct? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. You know, there's enough freshwater habitat, especially in, like, the Little Blackwater. So two of our sites in the Little Blackwater were, were fresh all the time. So 2007, 2008, 2018, 2019, they were always fresh um, because that's just a good source of freshwater habitat. So, you know, there's enough, even if the salt comes up downstream, maybe near Key Wallace or something, but, you know, hopefully there's enough area they can can get in but they can they can stand it i mean you know we've caught large amounts of bass in five six parts per thousand right so and that's you know that's fairly brackish now we know that that you did this study with with uh joe love as well but joe was telling us you were working on something else after this survey correct hold on hold on before, oh. be, before i go to that i want to go back to this survey and that survey i know where you're getting ready to go okay. with the consumption thing right? right okay so um back to the survey real quick before we talk about consumption so in the 2018 study, what was the difference between the previous study? Where, where was the where was the declines at? Because if I remember correctly, it was how many species declined? It, it was 80 percent, if I remember correctly. Okay, so 80 percent of the native species in the refuge declined in relative a, abundance. Eight, it, it was 80 percent of the species that were observed in both studies. Yes, is is, is that correct, Josh? Yeah. So if you looked at the species that we actually caught in both studies, you know, I think it was like 17 of 21 actually declined in, in relative abundance. And we say that because we don't ever know true abundance right. exactly how many are out there. So, yeah, that's what happened. Um, and that was kind of the driver. You know, five of the six sites we sampled um, were significantly different between time periods, between before and after snakehead. Um, and that was largely driven by a, a, a big reduction in, in biomass, just overall biomass of fish. I mean, you know, we used to just fill our tubs up with fish and, you know, we sometimes we'd be there for an hour or two counting fish and, you know, we got to leave the net in the water so we don't kill them. Right. And, you know, we just, we just didn't see that biomass in 2018, 2019. And, you know, we just, because that was also a one year study, um, we, you know, we don't quite have the funds to get out there every month, every year, but we actually are continuing uh, seasonal sampling. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. We didn't get out in 2020 like we wanted to. Um, well, that's because of the whole start. COVID thing, I'm sure, you know. Yeah, yeah. So we're able to get back out, and we're actually just out there earlier this week. So we, we're back surveying the same site the Very same good. way. Um, and we're so, going to do that seasonally. So, so that was so, our spring so, sample. We'll, so does that mean that we're going to get even more peer-reviewed data to share with the public that's true? Absolutely. That's oh, I love it. Good. Good deal. Good deal. <laughs> Bring it on. Um, so... So we saw a big switch in abundance. What what was the biggest decline that you guys saw in the in the fish population? Was there something that really stood out that really raised alarm to you guys when you were looking at it? I mean, the biggest decline was in white perch. Actually, mm-hmm. I mean, we caught ten tens of thousands. I think we caught twenty thousand across both years of white perch. And then over the 2018, 2019, we we caught a thousand, but that's a, a pretty big reduction. <laughs> I know. And from from twenty thousand yes. to one thousand. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's and, unreal. and you know, there's, there's some indicators that, uh, we can look at that, you know, should we have expected a, that big of a decline in white perch? And, uh, luckily like, uh, we don't have a ton of other data, but the state does a striped bass stain survey in nearby rivers, the Nanticoke and the chop tank. And if you actually look at their young of year index, which would be a, an indicator of uh, reproduction and, and a healthy population from 13 to 19, uh, the Nanticoke River was twice as high as the long-term average um, in terms of the, the count of white perch. So, 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 so let me hear that again. Let, let, let the public hear that again. The, the survey in the Nanticoke was what again? Let me let me understand that. It showed that the white perch younger year was twice as high as the long-term average in during that time frame where, you know, so if it was high in the Nanticoke and it was above average in the chop tank, um, you'd expect that it would have been the same in the Blackwater. We should have seen that abundance of, of white perch. So. Exactly. I'll tell you what, this is getting deep. We're getting deep with this thing. Let me ask you another question. I'm, I'm going to ask you a loaded question. So loaded. now it's going to be the loaded one. And it's the one we talked about before the program. If you as a biologist, you as a man who's collecting scientific data, you as a man who's watched it just as I've watched it, you know, from, from the grounds itself, is, is it fair to say that this is 
more of a result from Snakehead introduction than anything else? I mean, that, that's kind of the question that everybody out here is asking. Do we really think that the Snakehead is responsible for most of what's happened here? Yeah, it's hard to put a figure on it, but Snakehead is definitely a major factor. You know, we can't say that it's 100%. We can't even say, you know, it's uh, 80%. You know, but if you look at how the watershed changed or didn't change over the decade between studies, um, you, it's not a lot. It's not, it wasn't a huge change in the watershed. You know, most of the watershed that we sample was protected by black water. So there was no major land use changes. Right. Uh, you can point to the fact that salinity was lower in 2018 and 2019, but <laughs> because we had more fresh water, that doesn't explain why we had less fresh water fish caught, you know? Right. So, um, that's, that's kind of why we can say, well, snakehead's a major change before snakehead. There really was no, really abundant apex predator in the system. I mean, right. There were some large amount bass around for sure, but there wasn't a huge population of them. And the ones that were here, I mean, we had a nice mix of everything. We didn't have big bass and that's it. You know, right now, everything that we're seeing out here is just mature, big fish, you know? And, and I think the biggest alarm to everybody here is where are our little buck bass that we used to catch, you know, on, on, on the, you know, when them small males would come in in March and late February here, you know, and you got a warm day, you could stand on New Bridge and you could cast up to the flat to the left and you could catch 50, 60 bass and they'd be anywhere from six inches up to five pounds, you know? So that's kind of the yeah, thing. That's, that's that kind mean, of the thing that I look at. You know, if, if that fish is removed from the equation, what happens when it's all snakehead? Yeah, and that's why it's hard to, you know, like I said, it might be, it's a little hard to put a finger on. Uh, you know, a lot of these species, uh, a lot of sunfish may have boom and bust years, so you could say that maybe it was a down year, but you wouldn't say that every, like, 80% of the species, uh, you wouldn't predict that there would be a significant reduction across that many species. Right. Maybe, if, not not, a, not every species, species would have, have a down year at the same year. Yeah, and it's the species that, you know, kind of makes sense. I mean, it's not it's not that difficult. I mean, we know invasive species when they become established, especially like they seem to be at Blackwater do cause problems and snakeheads are not any kind of specialist. I mean, they're eating what's most abundant. So if that happens to be young of year sunfish, then that's what they're going to eat. And as gizzard chad become more abundant out there, you're probably going to find more gizzard chad. Oh, God, that's what that's, we're finding this so, year. So, sure. so let, let me just touch on that a little bit. So, you know, I've been, you know, I talk to the netters all the time. And I don't know what you guys are seeing in the data of your collection, but we're seeing a hell of a load of three to four year class carp right now. And we're seeing just the biggest biomasses of mud shed that we've ever seen in our life here. So we're trying to yeah. understand, you know, is, 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 because of the predation on snakeheads, on the smaller fish in the refuge, which actually feed off of those two fish as the fuel and the food for our, our, our ecosystem, um, I'm wondering if because these snakeheads, you know, whether they're four inches or they're 12 inches, you know, pretty much these fish can go anywhere. You know what I mean? You look at largemouth bass, largemouth bass, a five pounder isn't running up a six inch ditch and hanging out for the day and eating what's in it. You know what I mean? So I, 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 think, I think the biggest thing that, that everybody's missing here is what is below the surface. You know, you know we, we love catching big fish. I love catching big fish. I love catching snakeheads. But I'm looking at the domino effect as you go down the chain of command in the species and you just look at what we're seeing and it's almost like that's the only thing that makes sense to us, you know, is that it, it, we know the bass, well, the bass right. didn't eat them all, you know, I mean. So I, right, so, so far, I mean, that's. And that's why we're going to keep, you know, doing the survey to see if, you know, either the current trends continue or do, do things rebound in any kind of meaningful way. But if you look at the ecosystem, whereas before I'd probably argue it was like uh, a middle out thing. You had a lot of these medium sized fish, your black crappie, right. your white perch, uh, your sunfish, and you had fewer apex predators and fewer of those uh, bottom feeders, going to call them that, your, your gizzard shad and your common carp. So then it makes sense that if, if you flip it and, you know, I don't know what's most abundant in terms of weight out there. Honestly, it may be carp right now, but if you flip it from either bottom up like carp and gizzard shad or snakehead pushing it down, you're just going to change the, the biomass of any of the other groups. Right. One thing I've noticed is I don't remember last year anybody – Catching a snakehead with a carp in him. 
Mm-hmm. Or, no, or no, 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 no. Remember, Corn Flower had that one last year that he one. had that had a black salty. That was like one. Black salty. Didn't have a yeah, carp. Yeah, it wasn't a carp. It was a black salty right. that somebody had let go here. Or maybe it didn't get eaten. It, it was about. It could have been one yeah. that somebody was fishing when they lost, too. Right. Right. But still, either way. but That's one. But this year. They're catching a bunch of them with carp exactly. yeah. and, and mud shad, too. Well, you look at the one that I had here a couple weeks ago. What was that, Eddie, 32? It was a 30-inch 30, 30 fish, I believe. Had it had an 18-inch carp, is that what it was? It had an 18-inch carp yeah. in it, and it was, uh, uh, I think it was 13 pounds, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was 13 pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it was crazy. Like, I picked this, I picked one of the net fish up out of the cooler when I picked it up. Like, sometimes when they're limp like that, you know, and they got something in there, if you grab them in the stomach and pick them you up at the halfway it. point, they'll spit it out, you know, as you're picking it up. So uh, I literally just put, put my stomach, yeah, my hand on the, the stomach. Tail yeah. On the no, that that was the shad. I'm talking about the Oh carp. yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yep, and yep, and yep, then yep. we had the week before that fish had a 13 inch gizzard shad, and yep. I think it was, and that was a that was a 28 inch fish, wasn't it? Yeah, it was less than 30. 28. Ricky had a 26 inch catfish with a 20 inch channel catfish, halfway decomposed with still the tail hanging out of its mouth. <laughs> you know, I mean, God, it, I, the, the, it's cool to see some stuff like that because you don't ever get to see things like that, you know. But it's also sad to see things right. like that. So, 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 Josh, we know you worked on on these two studies here. But we also no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh. One more question. Oh, my goodness. So, so before I move on to the next one, the, the study that we you just talked about. question now. Hold on. No, no, no. no, <laughs> the, no the, the study that we're talking about right now, it was peer-reviewed and it was approved, correct? Um, it wasn't, I guess, fully peer-reviewed in the sense it wasn't, it's not published in the scientific literature. It is a, it's in a report form, government report. Um, so we worked on, I'll say, I, I, we put it out for peer review, and the one thing, I've never actually probably gotten better comments on a rejected scientific paper, but they didn't have a problem with, you know, any of the uh, the methods or anything like that. What they said is we, we didn't really demonstrate that snakehead were abundant enough. So, and that's, it's a fair criticism because we don't, I think over our uh, surveys, we only call it like 120 Spike nets just aren't the ideal method to catch snakehead because it relies on the fish moving and, you know, they don't move a ton, especially in the 24-hour period. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll put it back out for review. What we did was, uh, well, we wanted to do a creel survey where we interview anglers fishing in Blackwater. We couldn't do that in 2020 because of COVID, but we did do a volunteer angler survey um, through uh, Joe and, and DNR, and so we're going to reanalyze that data, add it to the manuscript, and we'll put it back out for peer review. But um, so yeah, it's, right now it's just in a report; it is not actually in a scientific uh, uh, paper. Very good. Let's talk about. You go ahead. No, nope, you get to ask a question you. now. No, I'm not there. <laughs> no, 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 no. So we know no. you. <laughs> We know you worked on this study, but but Joe was telling us that you were also working on something else now as well. Yeah, so we did um, a study where uh, Joe, we wanted to look at uh, consumption, what snakeheads could potentially consume, and at the Snakehead Symposium uh, that was hosted by Virginia back in 2019, um, there was a paper presented that uh, gave a consumption model of what snakeheads would eat. And it's a maximum consumption, so it's the high end of what uh, a population could eat. So we took that um, model and we... Oops. Are you there still? Yep, yep, yeah, did you drop us? All right. Yeah, we, <laughs> yep, we, took, we took that model and we, we fit it to some Maryland uh, typical screen temperature data uh, as well as a hypothetical population of about 600 snakeheads, which is kind of what we would expect as a typical stream population in uh, the Potomac River. And then that, if you couple that with uh, how much they could eat and weight, and then we did some prey preference experiments in ponds to, to kind of partition that out to hypothetical pot community, fish community. So, yeah, I think that it was about six, six uh, population of 600 snakeheads could consume a maximum of about uh, 4,000 pounds of fish in a year. So, and again, that's on the high end. I'm um, at the maximum consumption model. Whoa, 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 whoa hold on, hold on. 4,000 pounds per fish per year? No, no, total. no total. 4, 000, the population. 600 fish. Okay, 600 so 600 fish, fish would eat 4,000 pounds. That's a pretty, right. that's still a pretty good bit, I guess. Hang on, right. like 70, 70 pounds a piece, roughly. Yeah. Wow. Right, that's a lot. And then, you know, like I said, it's, it's a maximum, so they're probably not feeding at that rate, or they're definitely not feeding at that rate all the time, all year. 
Um, and that's going to be driven by temperature, of course, and not really eating in the winter and things like that. But it's a step in the right direction towards understanding, you know, what these impacts may be. Uh, and it can be applied uh, kind of anywhere. So if you know the fish community uh, where it is and you know roughly the snakehead population, you might be able to figure it out. So if I had 600 snakeheads in Gray's Run, those 600 snakeheads would be responsible for eating 4,000 pounds of fish? At the most. At the most. The so, so let's just say right, three. Right, let's right, let's yeah. just say three thousand. That's a lot, man. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, it takes. I mean, they grow. You know, eight inches their first year, and they're so, so, they so, up so, to four inches a year. So my, a lot. my mind's just rolling. So if you've got a perch stream, and you've got, has anybody looked at that? Like the amount of perch that come through, like the yellow perch in a run, and what they may consume through that. I mean, because here's what something I'm looking at. I'm looking at the declines of yellow perch. In places like Gray's Run, Bush Creek, Otter Creek, you know, I'm looking at the declines of yellow perch in Swan Creek. I'm looking at the declines of yellow perch in the in the gunpowder in Joppa Town. Declines and, of white perch in Blackwater. Yeah, declines of white perch in Blackwater. I mean, how how, how am I, I mean, this is going to impact migratory fish for sure, right? Um, you would think. I mean, they they're going to eat migratory fish. I mean, we find uh, migratory fish in their guts at times. So I mean, I've definitely found yellow perch, um, especially because, you know, yellow perch also aren't going all the way back to the ocean. So they're right. going to inhabit the same areas that snakehead are uh, more or less year round. You know, I got T- Tony's in here on the thread and, you know, he's saying, you know, it's not just the fish. I mean, what about the ducks, the frogs, the muskrats? What about the other things that they're eating that we're not talking about? So let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, are, are, do you think that they're having any kind of impact on, on the amphibians, the frogs, the crayfish? And the only reason I'm asking that is you look at places like Buttons Creek, you know, over there. I had some ditches over there on the farm and, you know, I piled them for crayfish. And I'm being straight up with you. I have not seen a crayfish now. This is the third year. There are no mud bug holes anywhere, not just in that ditch, but on any other ditch along Buttons Creek, you know? Uh, I mean, you know, we, we go down there and we fish till dark. I mean, we don't, you don't even hear the frogs. It used to be so loud, you couldn't even hear yourself think, you know what I mean? You wanted to think you were a frog. You were there by the time you left, you know? Right. No, and it's, I mean, it, it, it's plausible. We don't really know, right? I mean, I found, I found frogs in their guts on occasion. It's not the – they're definitely – Fish eaters first and foremost, but you know they they It'll do like these frog other lures, things. Like yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. I said that, you know if you're using a frog lure, you know you're probably going to catch a snakehead. So we know they're having it in the same areas. Um, all that stuff's kind of been anecdotal at, at best. I mean, like I said, it, it could be plausible if you had a lot of snakeheads in there, I guess. But we don't. That's an, another thing where it's not like we necessarily have the frog population estimate in Buttons Creek to be able to make that comparison. All right, but, I got you. I got you. That, that's the, but it, that's it, the scientist it's talking one of those, there. Yeah, yeah, I know. I understand. Yeah, that. well, I mean, it's, it's one of those things, though. I mean, we don't – this is why we don't want people moving them around. We don't exactly. know what those impacts are going to be, where – and it's, those impacts are going to be different uh, in every different – uh, watershed that they show up in. I'll tell you what, it's, it's really sad. I, I wish there was a way that we could really get the eyes open in Aberdeen Proving Ground and get some work done in there because them guys up there in the Upper Bay are telling me all those creeks are just choked within the, within Proving Ground. You know, it's just, it's unreal is what they're saying, you know. So I don't know how much you know about that or what you've been told, but I'd really like to see us get a relationship established with them in some way, shape, or form and get something going out there, you know what I mean, do some sampling or something like that. But I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but it's just a thought that we had, you know. Yeah, well, it's, you know what that is, though? It's also a good example of what happens when the cross and pond is a good example. What happens when the population explodes and nobody's there fishing and getting rid of them? So. Right. Blackwater is a good example, too. I mean, you yeah. know, I've talked to the uh, biologists on the refuge, and when there were stormwater, you know, they managed those impoundments for waterfowl. And when, yep. Sometimes when they drain them down, they're just chock full of snakeheads. Yep. So, you know, there's, there is obviously been a, there, there has been a big increase in fishing pressure around Blackwater and Little Blackwater, but it's such a hard environment. Uh, the fish can spread out in so many different ditches, as you guys know. So, I, you know, we would need a lot of effort there to, to help reduce the population. And same, that, like you're talking about with average improving ground, if snakeheads are basically going there unchecked without yeah. anybody uh, getting rid of them. Let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about Conalinga Dam. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Okay, so... I got um, the latest... Good. Yeah, so, so sure. let's talk about where we're at with that, what we're seeing in the, in, in, in the, in the ladder and what's going on. Uh, I got the latest data, so it's up to date as of yesterday. Um, they've caught and removed uh, 373 snakehead from the West Fish List. 
And they're up to over 1,200 American shad captured. In, Good. Uh, so the shad bottom so, showed up. So, so snake kids are basically yeah. 25%. Yep, so far. Yeah. And I didn't yes, think about that. Damn, it's early. Man, that's crazy. And I think yesterday might have been the first day that they actually they didn't catch one yesterday in the list, so that might have been the first day. So we'll see, you know, was this first pulse of fish, was that fish that were already kind of there, butting their heads against the dam, or was cause it last year they caught fish even in, in the May. fall, yep, in the fall they were smoking out. So, One guy called me and said they were averaging 40 an hour, and that was back in, I think, September or August. They were catching them, yeah, hook and yeah. line. The guy was up there counting them, you know. Yep, yeah, and, and yeah, we're, those have all been kept for some reason or another. Some of those fillets are getting donated. Uh, some of those fish are getting dissected for gut contents. I think all of them have been empty except for one. Uh, Joe Love told me about last Friday. They actually had a, an elver in its stomach, so it's not surprising because the eel, the eel ranch right there, too, is a good place to catch right. elvers uh, that get trucked upstream as well. So, so, so um, why, 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 why do you think that the stomach contents are empty? I think when they're on the move, especially this time of year, uh, I think that's they're, they're really not feeding. Um, I mean, it might be why some people aren't as successful catching them too, or at least, you know, hook and line using right. some live bait or something. We had, we've heard the same story um, working with DC Fisheries. Um, they sample the chain bridge on the Potomac, if you're familiar with that. It's up near Great Falls. Really yeah. high flows. And the snakehead go up there this time of year, uh, probably due to the increase in flows, seeking new habitat or, or pairing up or whatever. And I think the majority of those fish are also empty as well. And usually sometimes the fish, like people see them behind rocks trying to get out of the current, taking a break, and they'll cast them and usually don't catch them either. Just today, uh, this, these ones are catching at the fish ladder. They're gut sampling. Are they, are they sexing them as well? Yep. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, <clears throat> I don't it. know what the, the most recent sex ratio is, but Joe told me, I think he picked up about 50 fish. And it was pretty close to it. A fifty-fifty ratio. Oh wow! Of, uh, really? Yeah, males and females. That's funny because yeah. I have not caught a male fish this year. And see, that was another so thing far. I wanted to ask you about when you guys were doing your survey. How many female were you? Were you sexing them, comparing how many to what? Yeah, yeah, we were, and we don't. I mean, I know what you guys have seen. We're, that's that's been a higher ratio than than we've seen. Yeah, we're typically pretty close to that fifty to fifty ratio. Huh. Um, so, but there might be there might be some differences between males and females, you know, depending on time of year and things like that. But yeah. I mean, it's definitely interesting to follow, and it's it's good to to know because there might be something going on we don't know about, you know, what that could be driving uh, sex determination. Yeah, it's, I mean, that was something that we were thinking about here. Like, we know the water is warmer here, and you as a biologist, I mean, you can tell the public water temperature affects the sex of the fish that are born. Am, am I correct in in that statement? Uh, it depends. I mean, it can for some fish, not all fish. So is that something that, so, that affects snakeheads or, or, or it, it, it's not something that I've come across, but it, I mean, okay. I'm not saying it doesn't happen either. So it, it could be something else too. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. Mm, wow. Uh, let, let me take a little break here. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about something. Let's do a giveaway. Let's do a giveaway before we give away anything. Okay. I want to, I want to talk about this company here. Okay. So this is a new company, high octane, a uh, high octane, high baits, octane. Okay, and um, you know, uh, I mean, this guy's making some really, really good stuff, and we're going to be giving away some of that stuff today here on the podcast. So make sure you pay attention. We just want to thank Steve and Craig for coming down the store today and sitting down with us and just talking to us about a couple of things. I mean, these chatter baits that he's making here, I really like these things because they've got a swinging hook on them. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with swinging hooks, but. Swing hooks sometimes really make all the difference in the world, you know, with your fishing. You know, it's a, a little bit more lifelike flow through the water, you know. That thing can just kind of flutter with it, you know what I'm saying? So uh, if, if any of you haven't checked out high-octane baits, make sure you check out uh, well, Craig, Craig. A couple of you guys are going to check them out as soon as we give you some. That's right. So make sure, make sure, make sure you check out Craig I'm and check out Steve. I'm checking that one out. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi, hi. He thinks he thinks we're going to give all these around the giveaway, right? We're, all going, we're going fishing after the show. <laughs> Shit. No, I'm just kidding. But, um... No, I mean, he's just making some really, really nice stuff. I mean, here, here's a, here, this spinner bait here. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, this is all musky grade. Ta- I mean, it's all, it's all, it's all, uh, what do you say? He, he hand bends all yes, his own wire. He, he does doesn't buy bend. anything pre-made. Yep. So here we are again. And this is the, one of the coolest things about snakehead fishing. We're seeing all these new guys come out with 
entrepreneur ideas. And, you know, a lot of guys are doing okay with this stuff. I mean, they've got this small end line right here. Beautiful. And I, I'm telling you what. They've got one I mean, of the there's, big, there's the, my hand, you know what I'm saying? There's my middle finger. So it makes another one with this bigger right? blade, too. Yeah. But, I mean, like this here, I think this is going to be great, especially put a little snakehead to screw yep. on the back of it. Um, I'll tell you what, Gary, let's, uh, let's, 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 let's give some away today. What do you think, huh? Oh, sure. Oh, I won. <laughs> you won? Oh, yeah, Gary. <laughs> There right. we go. Little end line. Yep, that's. A, oh yeah, that's a beautiful one too. That's a small blade weedless. Yep. yep. You know what I think One's they second. should put in there? Rocket fuel. Rocket fuel. I like it. First one to say rocket fuel wins that bait. Um, what else we got going on? So, uh, I know we talked to um, old school tackle. I know Brian's going to be donating some baits here. I'll tell yep. you what, Gary. Let's give something else away again. Let's let's right. give away another prize right here. There we go. Oh, another one. Ooh, orange one. Uh, that's the same thing in orange. Yeah. That, looks yeah. like a, that, looks, that looks like a wolfer color right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Orange sickle. Orioles. Rocket fuel and Orioles. Yeah. Let me grab one more thing to get away. I got some nice stuff over here from CCA. Eddie, why don't you talk to me about CCA and what we got going on with them? All right. So the CCA Great Invasive Count, that is going on right now. If you're signed up for that and you're in our tournament as well, we're, we're going to be uh, drawing for an angle cooler on Saturday. So I can't remember if Dave said we're going to do that at the captain's meeting or at the end of the tournament. I don't captain's remember that meeting, at, the, at the captain's meeting. So we're going to be drawing. If, if you're in both our tournament, uh, the Snakehead Spring Kickoff, and the Great Invasive Count, you're automatically entered in to win this cooler. It's a great cooler. Too. I don't know if anybody's seen this cooler, but this thing is, like, really, really nice. Like, I almost thought about taking it and then going and buying, like, a crappy cooler from Walmart and bringing it back and putting it in the box and writing Engel on it. I don't think that'll work. No, please try it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's give away some more. Let's throw thing something here. small at one of these lures. That's right. And let's give away something else here. Let's give away something on behalf of CCA. How's that sound? Right. Reach in that CCA bag and see here. what you got, got a there. Big one, buddy. Cup. Oh, it's the 25 year, baby. 25 year cup right there. Yep. 95 to 2020. Cool. You want that cup? Say, I like coffee. Okay. Pretty good, hot or I like cup. coffee. Put that in the comments. All right, so Josh, what, what what else are we working on in Blackwater? Is there anything else that we're working on other than snakeheads? Um, not well, not necessarily. I guess directly in, in Blackwater. Um, well, we do have. I am working with actually Dave Scorsi and the Eye Angler, the great Chesapeake and Basin Count. So, oh, that worked out actually, real good, didn't it? Yeah, and like, <laughs> you got you know him. That one up. But uh, so he's actually going to, you know, he provides the data to, to me and Joe, and you know, we can analyze that data. We actually can get an estimate of fishing mortality from it, which is great. Things like you just mentioned, like sex ratio, if people are willing to dissect them, take pictures of, you know, the ovaries, as well as uh, if they do want to, want to get down dirty, do gut content, that's pretty helpful. Um, sometimes a lot of it's pretty decomposed, but at least we can know if it's a fish or not. So um, we're working trying to with, figure out what it was. It's pretty crazy because oh, yeah. most of the fish here that we've been got checking here have, have had stuff, you know. I would probably say realistically 75% anyway. Yep. Yeah, the one we caught uh, during our sampling this week, uh, I think had a crayfish in the gut. But um, So that kind of stuff, I mean, that data is getting used. So, I mean, I encourage people to, uh, you know, participate in that great Chesapeake and Basin's County got a chance to get prizes too. So it's a win-win all around. That's right. That, yeah, that, they, that, they just give away uh, all kinds of prizes just, just for being in the uh, in the count. Oh. Back, back to the dam. Did you say the, the contents that they found were eel? That's what they found? Just in one fish so far out okay. of all the ones that have been gut, uh, gut sampled. So are, are they talking? Uh, are they talking about above the dam at all? I mean, is anybody seeing anything up there? Are you getting any reports, anything up there? I haven't heard anything, and I know I'm not. Uh, agencies were sampling up there last year. I suspect they're probably doing some surveys this year, but I haven't heard anything just as of yet. I mean, obviously we know they're up there. I think there was uh, a dozen or two that got up past the dam in 20, 2019 or 2020. So we know they're up there. Um, hopefully, you know, it'll, we can get rid of them if people catch them. But the small population right now. So I was talking to a PA, a PA biologist yesterday, and he told me that they are dumping these things in every single lake up there that you can think of just about. He's yeah, like, I mean, that's a shame. That's what I mean. The, kind of the beautiful part, if you want to say, about Conwingo and the fish list is that it's a, it's a, it's a stopping point, choke point, where we can actually stop the fish from getting further up the, the, 
watershed. You know, there's there may need to be some additional effort put in, but right now, I mean, those fish are getting sorted, and we're at 100% removal at the fish list. So oh. it's the one few times that we can actually stop them from from you know increase and spread. So when it's a little disheartening when people you know move them around. I mean, there's there's species in uh, Pennsylvania that there's oh. things that are concerned about. There's a uh, Chesapeake log perch. It's a pretty rare species yep. that is uh you know there's a lot of effort being put in to restore them and you know i wouldn't want to see a bunch of snakehead put in where they're trying to do all this restoration effort for a fish like that so, i agree uh, and then we don't know realize the forward damage from, from doing something right and like we have no stuff. idea what what might happen in these non-tidal streams yeah i mean i i, I was ta- i was talking to to the guy yesterday and uh what he was telling me in there uh, was that they had had a report from Redmond that you know, they had seen some there. Um, the other the other area, I'm just trying to look here to see what he was telling me here again. Uh, it was a lake up there that they're in. Uh, let me see. Where is it? Here it is. This guy, Dylan, he's got a page up there in PA2, so a lot of them guys talk to him about stuff that's going on up there. Uh, but I was talking to the biologist, and he also said that one uh, one of the lakes up there, I think you say it, Lake Antalani or Lani, I'm not sure. Uh, but they said that they're, they found them in that lake this week, and, you know, they've been recorded in several other lakes here over the last year up there. And these are, like, cold, colder areas too, man. You know, that's what was kind of shocking to me. It's colder water, you know. But, you know, they live everywhere in Russia, so there ain't any reason they couldn't live up there either too, right? Yeah, yeah, they're pretty hardy. I mean, they can take the cold temperatures, and it obviously gets pretty cold. I mean, black water on a cold winter will oh, yeah. freeze over pretty good. So, well, is there, is there anything else that we want to talk to Josh about today before we get into the tournaments and what all we got going on with all that? Yeah, I think we touched everything we wanted to touch on. Josh, is there anything that I haven't asked you today that you want the public to know? Um, well, I do know that you know we you mentioned black water, and we are we will be doing more in black water. We'll be doing that. I think Joe mentioned it last week. Uh, we'll be doing a high reward tagging program yes. where folks can catch fish, they catch a tag fish. Um, they'll be able to to get a nice monetary reward for that, and that'll help drive some effort. Um, we'll and be and doing I, that. I think some right. of that. I think I think I think some of that money is what was allocated by Andy Harris for the snakehead research. Is that right? Well, actually, so that was actually a separate project that's going to the state. But we, my office, will be getting some of that funding, um, that Good. that increase in snakehead funding, and we will be doing a similar program um, in the upper part of the bay. Um, we have we have to work out the details, but um, we'll also be increasing our surveys in the upper bay. Um, we're probably going to be able to get some some more money to the state for helping out um, for some of those uh, the fillet operations and beneficial use of those snakehead that get uh, caught and killed at kind of window. So we have some things in the work going on uh, with all that as well. Let me ask you a question. Cause I have, I have quite a few contacts in the upper Bay. Would you like me to put you in touch with a couple of the folks up there that are really, you know, dialed in on the areas that they're at? Would that help you guys? I mean, if they want to let me know where to go to ideally survey, we'll set some, we, we're going to set something up. So we're going to survey, you know, different rivers in the upper Bay. Probably we'll get a handle on, uh, start to get a handle, a better handle on what's up there. Ideally, spread uh, slow the spread of the fish that are you know going up to Susquehanna and any of those other Upper Bay rivers, and try to drive more effort there. I'm sure that'll upset some anglers, but you know it doesn't sound like there's any shortage of fish up there right now. It just kills me. These guys are crying because people are coming and fish, fishing the places they're fishing. They just do not understand that it's you're not going to get rid of them. I mean, we know that. You know, I think you know that in the real world. And I think Joe knows that in the real world. I don't know what we're going to yeah, do, but at this point, I don't think we're getting rid of them. So it, it, this, this whole protecting the snakehead thing, you know, I just, I don't get that. You know, I, I guess, I guess I'm just not there emotionally. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I don't have no, that right. emotional connection to where I feel that way, you know? Right. There's been, I mean, we know that if there's enough effort, we can control the population, but it's not going to eradicate them. Right. And we've seen it in the Potomac, you know, especially I think both fishers, they can really, clean up uh, especially the, the good ones and know where they're going and that can probably knock back the population but if they move on to another one we know in a couple of years that right. that population will probably bounce back so you know we need effort out there um the public the anglers are can be out on a lot of different water bodies over a longer period of time than than we or dnr or any other state agency can so uh, we really need both uh, agency and public effort to, to drive these control efforts. And, and that's what it is. It's control. We're trying to, 
we can minimize the biomass of snakehead, hopefully we, that also means we can minimize the impact, you know, to native fish. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I really want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to Joe. I want to say thank you to all of everybody who has really, really stepped up to the plate and really been determined to try to really figure out this whole, this whole, this whole thing. You know what I mean? It's, it's something that we're unraveling one day at a time, you know, and I think the biggest thing that we can do at this point is to educate the community. And I think that's the whole purpose of the, the show today. And that was the purpose of the show last week. You know, I think that we all know, you know, we're not going to get rid of them, but I think for me personally, I have a responsibility to the places that I care about. So if I see something there that, that is not looking right to me, then you better believe I'm going to do anything and everything in my power to try to make a difference. And I think, that's where we have to start looking, you know, like it, you know, if you were catching 20 snakeheads at your place last year and now you're catching 80 this year and you're going to sit there and tell me there's no impact, I'm not buying it, dude. I'm not buying it, you know, because there is. That's the bottom line, you know. Well, um, ultimately, if we don't do anything and, you know, we what we're seeing, you know, some use crossing pond or maybe Aberdeen, if you're going to end up with a whole lot of snakehead and maybe a little else of what you other fish you actually want to catch. So I know, I know me personally, I always like to catch a variety of fish yeah. from going fishing and not usually catching one of, or right. a lot of one thing. So. What, I wonder, is, is anybody that you know of ever been going back to that pond in Crofton? Oh yeah. And uh, to see if, um, if they've repopulated I, it. Yeah, I think they have. And I, you know, that or at least in ponds nearby. And some of that is, totally driven by you know they're in the production and some of those ponds flood so they can get in there on that when it floods um yeah i don't know if that specific pond where they were has snakeheads in it or not but i know some of those other ponds especially the ones that are in the, the flood plain there uh they have snakeheads in them well again i just want to say thanks Absolutely. and uh we're, we're gonna let you go and we're gonna close this out talking about the tournaments yep. and what we got going on tomorrow and uh Josh, like I said, our door is always open for you. And if uh, if you want to come over here and hang out for a day and, and go fishing, it, it, me and Gary will be happy to help you out. And we'll make sure that we have some fun snakehead fishing. If you want to go down to the beach and do something, let me know. And I'll hop and I'll ride shotgun with you. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. And yeah, my door is always open too. Got any questions? Let me know. Dude, you've, been, you, you've, Thanks, you've been more than accepting to us. And, and I'm sure. very grateful for that. Thank you. Well, we appreciate your help trying to get the word to the public. Thank you. We'll Thank talk you to you Josh. soon, buddy. All right. So, guys, there's two days left to register for the Snakehead Spring Kickoff. Right. Two days left. Right. So, Kaz, tell us a little about it. So, here's the deal. You're going to come here to the store. Everybody's going to meet here at 530. Is that what we're doing? Five o'clock. Five o'clock. So, you're going to be here at the five, five o'clock at the store Saturday morning. So, everybody's leaving at the same time. Yep. Um, you can fish anywhere. One day. One day. One day. One day tournament. We're not That's doing right. two one days day anymore this time. No, no two, today and tomorrow. Yeah, well, tonight yeah. no more. Yeah. Right, day, day, and a half. day and a half, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, days, but, not. but but no, I mean, this is going to be a lot of fun. we got a lot of people signed up. There's going to be yep. a lot of great guests here during the weigh-in that we're not going to tell you about. You're just going to be surprised when you get here. A lot of great prizes. Yeah, man. We're going to be giving away prizes through the whole weigh-in. Um, you know, if you want to bring your chair down, you want to bring your kids down, you want to watch a snakehead weigh-in, you're more than welcome to come to the Wolford store. We're going to start the weigh-in at 430. Is that what we're going to do? So we need anglers be here at 4 30 and we're going to start the way in a little bit just after that so we get everything yeah get everything set up but yeah everybody needs to be back at the store by 4 30 if you're not back at the store by 4 30 your your catches will not count now we had some kids last yeah. year some new guys that didn't know the rules and really didn't know much about snakeheads it was an right. honest mistake so not if you show year, if, 2019. It, 2019. <laughs> if you show up okay at the way in and you've got live snakeheads in your cooler and you Disqualified. haven't killed them and you haven't done anything Please know DNR is going to be on site here. Okay, so if you have live fish, you're opening the door for That's a little you. bit of trouble. That's on you, okay? So we're not going to play that game with you. And DNR will be here to make sure that uh, that your fish are legit. Uh, secondly, um, if we think that your fish has been compromised, we're going to check your fish. Yep. Okay? Aren't we gut sampling everything? Uh, no. We're, we're going we're gonna to gut sample as much as possible. Okay. Um, but... It's it, we can't guarantee every fish. Right. I mean, there's just not right. enough time right. not, because it's a one day tournament. We're going to try if, and get everything if, done, wrapped up in the same day. If I see something that's got big in it, we're going to go for it. Right. If, I, if I see something that doesn't look right, 
We're cleaning your fish, bro. Exactly. Okay, if your eyes are cloudy on your fish and your fish is stiff as a board and it's losing pigment, you're going to try to tell me you caught it two hours ago, I'm going to tell you to pack your crap and get up the road. You know what it's, I mean? So, it's still frozen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's $50 to enter um, into the Snakehead Spring Kickoff, which is sponsored by Angler, Sport, Angler Sports Center. But now if you enter all four tournaments, tell them no. about that. Tiny, hold on. Okay. Time out. Sorry. I haven't got that far yet. All right. That's That's next on the list. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm worse than Get a bull in a China shop, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the spring kickoff is sponsored by Angler Sports Center. Uh, remember, anglers are going to be all, everybody in the tournament is going to be competing, uh, accumulating points towards the Angler of the Year prize. That's across all four tournaments, which is sponsored by CCA Maryland's Great Invasive Count. Dave um, Scorsese, thank you very much for yeah, getting that done. Absolutely. Dawn. Thank you very much. Um, we also have uh, four Calcuttas, $10 each to enter. Um, the first one is the heaviest of the tournament, sponsored by Bass Rack Outdoors. Kevin! The longest fish of the tournament, which is sponsored by Horseman Enterprises. Benny! The most uh, snakeheads <laughs> caught in the tournament, a uh, minimum eight of eight inches, sponsored by the Land Group. Rob! The, the heaviest <laughs> snakehead of the year, which is the heaviest snakehead across all four tournaments, uh, which is sponsored by the Bait Boys. Damien! And, of course, the always free-to-enter youth division sponsored by uh, Roy Bradshaw's Body Shop, which is the single heaviest snakehead by a youth. Roy! And, hey, look, if you get caught in a ditch, call Roy Bradshaw. We'll get you out of there right away and get you and Jiffy. Thank you. That's right. So, <laughs> <laughs> if you enter in all four, obviously, we're doing the Snakehead Club. We've talked about it before. Our first meeting would be May 19th. We're going to have the sign-ups online um, as soon as possible. We've been busy getting ready for the tournament, so that's not up yet. Um, but we're also... We'll do signups at the door at the, at the Snake Club as well. So if if you can't sign up online, we'll we'll sign you up right there. But if you're entering in all four tournaments, then you're free into the club, of course. And we will have the winner of the tournament there yes. at our first Snakehead Club meeting to talk about how yeah. he did it, you know? his techniques, everything, the whole works. So it's going to be good. We got a lot of good stuff coming together this year. You know, we, we got some stuff in the works with Leroy. We're helping him with some stuff. Yep. We're working on some stuff with anglers, helping them with some things. Yep. Uh, we're, we're really, we're really honored that the media has been reaching out as much as they have to us about stuff. For sure. Um, we're hoping to see all you guys down here, all you television stations on Saturday, WJZ, WBAL, Delmarva Outdoors. Come on, let's get over here. WBOC, all you guys, Fox 5, Fox 45, let's do it. Snakeheads are a hot topic. Then that ain't all of them, bro. <laughs> a lot more than that. I'll find them all. All right. So I think that's everything on mine. You got any one more, Scaz? Not any more one more. Um... Let's give away some free. Oh, we got we got to announce our winners for the prizes first. Um, oh yeah, for the uh, the rocket fuel, that is Gar <laughs> Gary Gracie won that one. Go Gary! Um, for the Orioles, that was Tony Henson. Kapow! And for the CCA Cup, that was David Green. Kapow! Eddie, how are the Orioles doing this year? They doing okay? Uh, we'll skip that topic. <laughs> this, uh, this is a fish. Well, then, didn't, didn't, didn't they just take two from the Yankees or something? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so we had a good series. That was a good thing. We had a good series at, against the Yankees. The Yankees are, are back in last place again, and we're not. And that's that's we'll leave it at that. All right, and then look. Okay, so so we're going to be changing some things on some of the platforms. Okay, if if you want to advertise your products yep. on any of the platforms, we have no problem with you promoting your products, doing things like that. The only thing that we're going to ask of you is to give us something to donate to give away on the podcast. Okay. We don't mind helping you advertise your products and make thousands of dollars. And we put these rules in place last year on the page and, and we got and, slack and, on it. You know Well, yeah, I mean? we, we, we weren't enforcing it too heavy, but it's, yeah, COVID we, we, and all that, yeah, we, we have saying. to, we have to start enforcing it. so it doesn't take over the whole page. Right. That, that, We've had some people complain about all this. He's advertising this, that, and the other. So we really need to start enforcing that rule, and so we're going to start doing that. Yep. So, uh, so you, if you want to advertise, you can advertise your company once a week, okay? Or, or yeah, I think once a week's fair. You know, once a week, and they donate something, and we'll mention them on the podcast for that week. Right. Well, they have to. They have to give us something to give away on the podcast. Right. So that's, that's the bottom line. Yep. So, so if you want to advertise your spinners, you want to advertise your rods, you want to advertise your this and advertise your that, give us a little something to give back. You know, to pay it forward. You know, that's all we're asking. We're not right. asking you to pay to advertise. We're asking you to pass it on, man. You know, exactly. how do people know about your product if you're not giving it out to them? You know, and if everybody's got to buy it, I, 
I, you know, I, I always like to give away something so people can see what it is. And then once they see what it is, then they'll buy it. So if you yeah. think like I think, it's really a smart really way to do this. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Word of mouth, the best advertising there is. Yeah, that's I mean, exactly this right. is a smart way to do it. You know what so. I mean? So, and we want to be fair with everybody. We're not haters. We yep. want everybody to do good, you know? And we, if we can help you do good, that's what we're here for. We have meetings every week with Lord Designers and Lord Builders talking about new stuff. So, Rob, well, you're exactly right. Caps are in first place, baby. Let's go. Uh oh. Rob. Oh, Rob Ballantyne's been watching. What's going on, buddy? I've been watching too much. What'd you think of that? That was pretty good, wasn't it? I was going to ask him about the Odolith, but I forgot about that. That's okay. So anyway, let's. Uh, we're we're at, we're at an hour and four minutes. We had a pretty good. Yep. Uh, we had give, a pretty give good show. Crabs, yeah, go. man. So look, it's now. It's time. The Sunday Fun Day giveaway, but we do it on Thursdays here at the podcast. So all right. So look, out at the crab stand. The Crab Stand, home of the guaranteed number one Maryland crab. When you want crabs, you want fresh crabs, you want the Crab Stand. All crabs are from right here on the eastern shore of the Little Chop Tank River, the Miles River, Tillman Island. We get the good crabs, heavy crabs. I don't sell junk. Look, if somebody says your crabs are too much, they're just not good enough. It's that simple. So, look, folks, I'm going to leave you with a little crabby jingle. You got to give away your crabs first. That's what I'm doing. My crabs, they had. Hold on, hold on. Don't you cannot screw up the system. Oh, Before, I got to I got to interrupt I, your I song. Was give them away first. Man. You, you, you rules got is rules. the rules is rules. You give away the crabs and then you sing. I was going to switch it up and do it after the singing. <laughs> That's all. Right. All right. So look. So here's this week's winners. I was going to give away a bushel of crabs, but hey, well, I'm not going to give away just one bushel. We're split into three winners this week. We did two winners last week. We do three winners this week. How's that? So look. So Carol Sawyer. Kapow! I'm going to give you a third of a bushel of Maryland crabs mixed. Stacy Omen. I'm going to give you a third of a bushel of crabs mixed. James Garland. I'm going to give you a third of a bushel of crabs mixed. If you want to know how to win crabs, all you got to do is go to the crab stand page, share the post, and like, comment, and invite one friend in the comments, and you're entered right away. I randomly pick the numbers. I don't pick my friends. If your friend pops up, then, hey, it just came from the name picker. That's how it goes. It's not me. So before we leave you, let me leave you with a little... Should I sing now? You can sing now. Okay. So before I leave you, let me leave you with a little crabby jingle. (laughs) It's pre-recorded. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> My crabs, they have three first names. It's heavy, full, and fat. My crabs, they have a fourth name. Absolutely mustard pack. If you ask me where they're from, they're 100% guaranteed Maryland number ones. A little crazy. Yeah. At the crap day, here's a fact I know for sure you're coming back. Kapow! 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 <laughs>